Shabbat Salam, Yasharala. Welcome to this gospel portion. Let's get started with a prayer and get this thing going. Heavenly Father, high in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And in the name of the mighty Mashiach, Yeshaya, amen. Guide and protect this message, Abba. All right, we are in week eight of the gospel portions, which means we are covering Matthew 15 and 16. Let's begin. Matthew 15. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly? and is cast out into the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Ooh, this is a... Uh... Kind of timing is on, all right? But uh, Charles, you say you want to, there you go. There's a cover page. We are back on red. But uh, I didn't know this going in, so I, I'm doing the rainbow each tour portion. And, it's, and I'm doing two chapters. Well, if you do that all the way through the book of Matthew, it completes exactly two rainbows. So I, I'm glad I'm able to co to complete it. So that means after this tour portion, we have six more remaining of the rainbow colors, by the way. All right. And so we just read all of this. A lot of people use this verse to go eat whatever food they want to eat, right? Pretty sure if you have at least talked to some uh, churchianity folks about eating unclean food, this is a top three verse, chapter Matthew 15, that they use. And they, of course, cherry picking, right? They go, they go all the way to one line and say, 
um, verse, um, yeah, verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, they defile the man. Where's the, um, let me see, is it, uh, do not ye understand that whosoever enter, whatsoever enters in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drought, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. So they, of course, that's all they pick, right? Cherry pick. They don't even go two verses down, verse 20. And obviously the things that goes in a belly, I, I, I've mentioned this with the, the parables that we have to understand with the parables. Matthew, the book of Matthew is speaking to someone that is already coherent with the law. So if he's speaking about food that goes in your mouth, then he's not going to speak about pork because they don't consider it food. And all of what they're speaking on is about unwashed hands. And I just love the way the Hebrew translation puts verse 2 and 20. If you read both 2 and 20, that in, in, and in the middle of it, Everything about this, which is why he gives an example, is how they treat their father and their mother. Ye hypocrites. And he compares them that they their works are in vain because they don't do the doc, they do the doctrines of men and not the most high's doctrines, right? And then, like I said, in the Hebrew translation in verse 2, why do your disciples transgress? The, te uh, the teachers of the ancient ones. Why do they not ritually wash their hands when they eat? That's what all of this is about. A ritual based on the customs of just some Israelites that wrote, uh, wrote this man-made law, which we may know as, in modern day time as the Talmud. It's the laws of the Pharisees, man's traditions. And then from verse 2, checking all the way to 20, the way we finish it, these things defile the man, but ritually unwashed hands do not defile him. It makes it crystal clear on what this chapter is about. And then just for you know, scriptural referencing in the, the, the prophecy of Isaiah. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That can be found in Isaiah 29, verse 13. Go ahead and just write that note in your Bible or on your notepad. Connect all the dots. Why not? Put them there. So you don't have to write it or look for it again. And then lastly, for verse 19. For out of the heart perceive evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, fornication, thefts, false witness, bless, and blasphemy. Um, we see that all throughout the canon. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. You know, the world tells you to follow your heart. <laughs> Come on, the canon says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusts in his own heart is a fool, but who who's but whoso walketh wisely shall be delivered. Amen. All right. Very straightforward for us Torah observance. If I was speaking to a bunch of people in the church, I would probably take more time and it would be more objective, but I don't have to here. Clear cut, you see it, it's about unwashed hands and about traditions of the elders, which is why he gave an example about how to honor your father and mother has been altered by the traditions of men. All right. going to read 21 through 31 now. 
Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, Great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And Jesus departed from thence, and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee, and went up into a mountain, and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak and maimed to be whole, the lame to walk and the blind to see. And they glorified the God of Israel. All right. Pausing right there. Uh -uh. All right. Let me see what I have here. So we see, we see a Gentile woman here. And I believe, let me see what I have there. Oh, before I seem like I should have read this one. Uh, my apologies. I should have read Mark 7, 2 through 4 for the the traditions of man verse. So let's let's read that before I continue. Uh, this is Mark uh, with the same story. I think it just gives a different understanding is why I made this note. But let's read it. Mark 7, 2 through 4. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled that is to say, with unwashed hands, and they found fault. So I, that, I think that's why I put that here, is that they literally tell you, I mean, this is, I'm, I don't even know how much clearer it could get, what the reason they approached them for and why they were causing, calling them defiled. I mean, this is clear cut. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, Eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. I mean, in a nutshell. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. So that's just saying, just another witness in another book of how clearly it's written if we're not cherry-picking scripture. And then I also... um. Wanted to touch on the fact that the traditions of the elders, it, when you come to full understanding of what the Gospels is about, because of course we have the crucifixion, the Passover lamb, reason why he came here. But I'm talking about why uh, the Most High, I mean, Messiah was alive. The entire thing with Messiah being alive was him battling the traditions of men. I mean, over and over and over again in all of the gospels, Messiah is battling the teachers of that time. And it's not saying that all the Pharisees and Sadducees are evil men, bad men, just like the tax collector. He went and plucked Matthew from the tax collectors. And so Matthew ended up being turning into a righteous man through repentance, right? So it's never saying that every teacher, Pharisee, Sadducee, scribe is evil. This is uh, the point of what I'm making is pay attention when Messiah is talking to other teachers because that is what all of it's about. And when we look in the book of Enoch on this note, I'm going to be reading in Enoch 93, and these, these I'm going to read the, just, and after that, Enoch both gave and began to recount from the books, 
And Enoch said, concerning the children of righteousness and concerning the elect of the world and concerning the plant of uprightness, I will speak these things. Yea, I, Enoch, will declare them unto you, my sons, according to that which appeared to me in the heavenly vision, which I have known through the word of the holy angels and have learnt from the heavenly tablets. And then Enoch began to recount from the books. And then he goes through the history of man in this parable, the history of man. And he starts off in the first week. Well, we're, we're going to the timing of what Messiah's time frame is. It is foreshadowing what's to come is my point. Let's read in verses eight and nine. So verse eight is the time of Messiah and verse nine is directly following it. And the whole point of when we read in God, the Gospels is for the people that's in the following time. Makes sense, right? Who is going to read the Gospel? Not even the people during Messiah's time was reading the Gospels because it wasn't written yet. They were living it. So the written version that we have of the Gospels is for us, everybody, after those generations. So verse 8 is Messiah's time. And after that, in the sixth week, all who live in it shall be blinded. We see this all throughout the Gospels. Why were the most pre prestigious teachers in Messiah's time didn't even know how to righteously keep Torah? Even uh, Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees that sat down and was trying to actually talk to him, that wasn't incriminating him and trying to get him killed. Even he was sitting down and trying to learn because he realized, man, I don't really know much. They were blinded. And the hearts of them shall godlessly forsake wisdom. And in it, a man shall ascend. Hello. Mashiach, this is his time. In this time, M Messiah ascended in heaven. And at his close, the house of dominion shall be burnt with fire. Oh my goodness. Can it be any more clear? This is the fall of Jerusalem, right? And the whole race of the chosen root shall be dispersed. Very clear. I don't even know how people try to say that Book of Enoch ain't a Masonic, uh, ain't, 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 excuse me, excuse me, not Masonic, <laughs> Messianic book. <laughs> and then listen to the, the following week, the following week after the disbursement in the Gospels written, right? Let's read it. And after that, in the seventh week, shall an apostate generation arise. It shall be and many shall be his deeds, and all his deeds shall be apostate. This is wisdom. He was living out and showing us how to speak against and to overcome the traditions of men, because that is what the week, the following week, the seventh week, verse nine, is speaking of in apostate. What does apostate mean? A person who renounces a religious or political belief or principle, abandoning a religious or political belief. If you are taking on the traditions of men and not the commandments in the word, then what have you done? You have renounced the Ruach, the living word, and has fallen into an apostate generation, a bunch of traditions of men, and even the Jews and Israelites were renouncing and falling into idolatry. Do y'all see how beautiful that is now? Messiah was showing us what was going to happen next for the people that was going to be living in the generation after him. And Enoch prophesied about it. Unbelievable. All right. Now on to the next. We just read about Messiah coming and healing the sick. And then we have a woman, a Gentile woman. And he says that he has not come for her. He come for the lost sheep of Israel. And we know that 
obviously the the gospel was uh, to be preached amongst all nations. Yeah, Enoch. I just read it. Enoch. That was Enoch ninety three. Verse eight and nine is uh the prophecy I just read, correlating with the gospels and what was to come from the gospels. And excuse me. And let me see where are we at. Oh, I'm supposed to be here. Let's read a chorus to verse. 22 and behold a woman of canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him mark 7 and when they saw some of the his disciples eat bread with defy oh excuse me wait a minute verse oh yeah 726 so this is the same story the woman was a greek and so that's really the main thing i just wanted to show it just wanted to show that this is a gentile woman but we know that even through the Exodus, that there was a mixed multitude. My point is, this is not so much that she is a Greek and more so about that this woman most likely was not keeping Torah. This is what he's saying. He's like, you're not, he's not, you're not of us. And obviously her being a Gentile Greek woman she is raised as a Greek, but I think more so this is about a woman that is walking, that is that is seeing the works of him and has faith that he can heal his her, her daughter, but she is not doing the works of the kingdom is what I believe as is what's going on with this Gentile woman here. And, and, and he is merciful and by her faith, he heals her child. And I think that was the breadcrumb of allowing her to give her an a opportunity with that breadcrumb, per se, from the, the dogs off the table to allow her to start walking like he walked due to her faith. Because we all know it starts with some type of faith, right, before we start walking like him. And then we see his many works. And then reading, I'm going to read Mark 7, 33 through 37 before continuing. And he took him aside from the multitude and he put, this is about what he just did. It's just right here, 29 to 31, but this is a different description in the book of Mark. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and he spit and touched his tongue and looked up to heaven inside and says unto him, uh, that man's name, that is, be opened. And straightway his eyes were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plain, and he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he changed them, charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it and were beyond measure astonished, saying, he has done all these things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. All right, let's finish off Matthew 15, 32 through 39. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes, and gave thanks, and brake them and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left, seven baskets full. And they that did eat were four thousand men, beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude, and took ship, and came into the coasts of Magdala. 
All right. The only thing I want to add to that is that this is very similar to the story in Matthew 14, the, just the last story. So this is where M Messiah is doing a majority of his healing and teaching in the, the thick of the book of Matthew is where we're uh, having that. So he has fed the poor or the multitude, not necessarily the poor, it's just the multitude has followed him out in the wilderness twice now. The end of Matthew 14, thir uh, verses 13 through 21, and now Matthew 15, 32 through 39. All right, Matthew 16. We're going to read verses 1 through 12 first. Matthew 16. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky. But can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread? that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Woo, all right. Um, a lot of good stuff here, man. Messiah just is on it. And, and I mean, that's what I was just saying is... Um, Messiah, the entire, I mean, just hit on a nail what we just read in Enoch. Messiah is preparing the following generation that the, the scribes, Pharisees, teachers of doctrine is, is beware of them. Clearly, this is what he's speaking about right here. But before we get there, I wanted to read verse, verse two and three. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Uh, other translations just have the sky is, is dark. And I'll, let me go to the Hebrew translation of this. But Yasha answered them and said to them, you say in the evening, tomorrow there will be bright light for the heavens are red and in the morning you were saying today there will be rain for the heavens are dark so this part is pretty pretty straightforward right if you see that the day is dark and cloudy and obviously looks like rain clouds and whatnot you will say oh it looks like it's going to rain but this part i would say probably goes over a lot of people's heads you say in the evening, tomorrow there will be bright light for the heavens are red. Check this out. The, the, we, we, we just don't know much of anything, right? A red sky appears when dust and small particles are trapped in the atmosphere by high pressure. This scatters blue light, leaving only red light to give the sky its notable appearance. And once again, this is at sunset. You know, when you have that sunset and the sky can turn red. Well, if that happens due to the balance of the atmosphere, a sky, a red sky at sunset means high pressure is moving in from the west. So therefore, the next day will usually be dry and pleasant. How about that? 
You say in the evening, tomorrow will be bright light for the heavens are red. So no, if you don't know, now you know. A red sunset, a sky sunset, will most likely mean clear skies the following day. All right, now, and now in uh, verse four, a wicked, adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Just wanted to say, what's the prophet, the sign of the prophet Jonas? In Jonah 117, now Haya had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We all know that is uh, about the time Messiah was in the tomb. In the belly of the earth. Just wanted to give that reference there. Verse 9. And then all of this, we also we all we gotta have understanding the leaven of the Pharisee is just false teachings, as we were saying. It's it's um it's using a parable because a little leaven can leaven the whole lump. So if you over and over again, if you're not fact-checking everything you're doing with the chapter and verse with scripture, and you add in a little bit of leaven, it could change the entire appearance of an understanding of any type of doctrine, which is what we just kind of went over about the food law that people try to use because they cherry pick. And even talking about the leaven, in some in some um translations, they literally say. That therefore he made all food clean. Literally insert it in the text in uh, Matthew 15 or Mark 7. Literally insert it in some translations. Crazy that they would insert that. You have a lot of guts. All right. And in verse 9, do ye not under yet understand, neither remember the five loaves? of the 5,000, how many baskets he took up. So he's saying, it's not about, I'm not talking about worry about you leaving food. He's like, I can, I can, I can bring food. He's like, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about a bigger problem. False doctrine of men. And we, like I said, for the end of Matthew 14 and 15. And in verse 12, then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisee and of the Sadducee. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. So this is the oldest means is the stuff that you were doing wrong from the Pharisees and Sadducees, teachers of men, doctors of men, as ye are unleavened. For even Mashiach, our Pesach, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of mouth. <laughs> of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So just saying that all of this is spiritual that Mashiach's talking of, just like Paul's speaking on. It's spiritual leaven, not actual leaven as the disciples in real time at this, this uh, chapter thought so. All right. Let's continue. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 
Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Um, I, I did, I did, I, I answered this in an earlier gospel portion of why Messiah keeps telling people to not go and tell others about the works that he is doing, the healing and whatnot. And this answers it in a nutshell right here. I, it couldn't be answered any better. Then charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Yeshia, the Mashiach. Why? Why? Because verse 17, Yasha answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee. He doesn't want men being, in other words, if you believe this is the Messiah, it shouldn't come from man, but my father, which is in heaven. He wants you to see it with your eyes and you to believe it. Not because I'm doing, I'm healing your, your grandma and, your, and, and helping your daughter. Don't come to me because of just my works. I want you to come to me because of the faith and the fact that Father is talking to you. He's revealing myself, as is talking about Messiah speaking, to you. So don't go tell people I'm the Messiah. I want them to come up to me and say, you are the Messiah. Then I will know that my Father has revealed this to you and not some man. As we all walked, we all have... We're living this, right? What is revealed to us is of the Ruach, right? Of Abba, not of man. It don't matter what man can tell us. It's not going to confirm any matter unless that Ruach hits different, that living word hits different. Abba's talking to you. It's different. All right, let me see where I'm at. All right, so yeah, let's talk about Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Let's talk about it. Matthew 7, 24 and 25. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him un unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat, up, beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And so he's building that church upon Peter. So we should listen to Peter and why Peter in the book of Acts speaks. And we're going to get to that in a second. And John, we see that he named him that for a reason. And he brought him to Messiah and Yasha beheld him and said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas or Peter, which is by interpretation, a stone or rock. He literally called his name Peter because it was prophecy being in fulfilled, coming into fruition. Then just to show you that Peter literally means rock or stone. As we see here, he's saying it's the apostle, but Peter. It means rock or stone. His literal name was changed to literally hit this prophecy, parable on the money. And then this is why, uh, why and how Peter is the one speaking and everyone's hearkening to Peter, the whole Jerusalem council, all the wise men that has been left in the stead of, doing, of per, partaking of the word in organizing and conducting the church of Mashiach in Acts 15, 7 through 9. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago, Mashiach, this is God, Messiah, this is who he's talking through. Messiah. Allahim made choice among us that 
the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And Allah, he which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Ruach Kodesh, even as he did upon us. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Thank you, Peter, for all you've done through the body of Mashiach. All right, let's finish this chapter now, 21 through 28. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be under thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, Thou art an offense unto me, but thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right, in closing here, we see that at any time, any time, you can become a Satan, an adversary of the kingdom. And it's not like, obviously, he still stood on that ground. He literally just said that Peter was going to be given the church. And then the very same chapter, Peter is called Satan. This is wisdom for us. It doesn't matter if you're a leader. It doesn't matter if you're the smallest of anyone in the church. At any appointed time, you can become a Satan if you obstruct the works of the kingdom. Check yourself. And obviously, Peter did. And this is how we're supposed to take criticism. Peter, I guarantee Peter was like, oh, my goodness, my bad. Like, I'm literally trying to stop you from, from fulfilling prophecy. I'm, I'm, you're right. I'm being selfish. I want you to myself and I don't want you to leave. He was thinking of his, for his own gain. Vanity. Everything is vanity. Very, I mean, very clear. And, and obviously Mashiach and the Most High stuck with Peter as we just read in the book of Acts. But man, this is a testimony to check your Ruach always. It's okay. It is 100% okay if you find yourself at fault. You just better correct yourself. That's all, it is, that's all it's about. Correct yourself. And then, verily, verse 28, I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in, in, coming in his kingdom. People misconstrue this saying that, oh, this had to happen during Messiah's time because he's speaking to those people. Guys, he did not single out anyone. He did not say, you, John, you're going to be here. He did not do that. He is speaking about those in the latter days, that there will be some that won't taste death because there's people that are still going to be alive and well when we, when we see him coming in the clouds. So I just want to make sure we understand that verse. That is very widely uh, verse that people are very confused about. It's not saying that there's going to be a 2,000 year old man still standing in the spot in Jerusalem. Saying that there's going to be people standing in this area, like Messiah said, that is here, living, breathing, and we'll see him coming in the clouds, which has been prophesied. That being said, to die for y'all joining me. This is week eight. I'll see y'all next week at another gospel portion. Shalom.